are lots of Australians here, which is fantastic. And as Andrea pointed out, I'm very proud to say there's lots of people from my research group here today. But it's a fantastic conference. And I also like to commend the organising committee for putting together the sports medicine with the sports physiotherapy. I think it's a great initiative. And we, are, we do need to work together as a team, and I think someone commented on that a number of times yesterday, that we do need to get out of our professional silos and work across the different disciplines to get the best outcomes for our patients. Perhaps I need the clicker. Um, I'm going to be chatting to you today about early OA in the athlete, and as Andrea mentioned, we um, have a large uh, prospective study going on at the moment looking at athletes with hip-related pain and looking at the factors related to the development or progression of early arthritis. The project's about halfway through, so we have a long way to go to have any definitive answers for you. But I'm very proud to say that the four people named under here are my PhD students in this area, and three of them are here today, which is fantastic. And then just to acknowledge the large number of people who are working with me on this project. So we know that hip OA generally affects the elderly or older people, and we're going to hear fantastic talks from um, Mayana Riesberg and also from Eva Roos today about that. But I'm going to be talking to you about um, athletes who might be presenting, so younger athletes, we're talking people un aged under 50, who have hip pain, and where does hip OA fit in their spectrum? And we've had a brilliant talk today, this morning, from Professor Lunig, um, talking to us about the surgical, I suppose, implications of CAM morphology and osteoarthritis. But I am a physiotherapist. I am going to put a physiotherapist lens on my interpretation of the data that we have and how we can apply that to our patients. Um, when we think about OA, we traditionally think about it as being a disease of the bone, not always, or it's a disease of the cartilage, and we diagnose it by looking at things like osteophytes and joint space narrowing. Um, but for this talk, we're going to be looking at um, the CAM morphology, but also things like um, labral and chondral tears that might be prevalent in athletes. So what is the prevalence of those um, early signs of osteoarthritis? the relationship between those signs and the development of osteoarthritis, um, the burden of hip pain and hip osteoarthritis in athletes, and uh, because I'm a physio, of course, I'm also interested in looking at some of the, the modifiable factors that we might be able to address in our clinics. So for the purpose of my talk today, I'm going to be talking about hip-related pain as pain that mostly occurs in the groin, or occurs in the groin, but also might occur in the lateral hip, um, but also in the buttock. And the patients might also present with symptoms of clicking, grinding, catching, other symptoms related to hip um, pathology as well. But I think the important thing for me is that they have to have pain that is aggravated by hip-related um, movements. So the fader, as, um, as Professor Lunig mentioned, and we had some great talks yesterday from Mike Ryman, but also things like Faber can also aggravate their pain, but also hip-related movements. So people who are running, people who are cutting, people who are trying to rise from sitting um, and kicking, those sorts of activities. So their pain has to be related to some hip-related motion as well. And that's what I'm calling hip-related pain um, in this talk today. And what we're going to go through is, well, how many of those people actually have some sort of structural deformity that might represent early osteoarthritis? And if we think about hip-related pain, as we've heard this morning, we often see or we consider it a condition where we might start with the CAM morphology um, or FAIS, depending on your terminology you want to use, and that that can relate to some sort of development of labral pathology. And over time, we might see that developing to some chondral damage and then eventually to end-stage osteoarthritis. So we're seeing this spectrum of, um, of osteoarthritis occurring in people with hip-related pain. So to answer our first question of do athletes with hip pain have CAM morphology, there have been a number of systematic reviews and if we look at all of those together, um, we see that exactly what was mentioned this morning, so asymptomatic people in the general population, about a quarter of those will have um, CAM morphology as, um, as seen on X-ray. 
But if we look at athletes who are asymptomatic and participating in sport, we see that more than double the number of athletes um, will have a CAM morphology compared to people who are non-athletic. So we see more than half of our asymptomatic athletes running around playing sport with a CAM morphology. And if we pull all the studies that have looked at um, people with pain, so these are mixed populations. These are not just athletes. These could be athletes or non-athletes. Uh, we see that the prevalence of CAM morphology in people with symptoms is roughly the same as those in asymptomatic athletes. And so I suppose going back to some of the questions that Andrea had is how do we know whether the CAM morphology is actually the cause of the pain in those athletes? or general population, and also what, but also what we don't know is whether these asymptomatic athletes with the CAM morphology are also going to go on to develop pain over time. So these prevalence studies are based on cross-sectional studies where we take a group of people at a given time, we x-ray or MRI their hip, and so we still don't have enough information about the long-term or the longitudinal um, effects of some of these bony morphologies that we may or may not see. But what we do know from the literature to date is that um, people with symptoms do not have a higher prevalence of CAM morphology than asymptomatic athletes um, without any pain. Josh Heary, who's here today, he's a PhD student with Joe Kemp and I, and he's going to be presenting um, in, the, uh, in the free paper award session later today. So I'm not going to tell you what he's going to say, but come along and hear his talk on the association between bone morphology and pain in footballers. I'm also going to highlight a couple of, um, I also need to acknowledge that Josh made all those pretty slides with all the coloured men, which is very handy for me. Um, so Josh um, did a systematic review uh, looking at the prevalence of other sort of imaging relating findings that we might see in people with and without pain. And this is a systematic review that's been published in the most recent um, Sports Physio Swiss uh, sponsored BJSM uh, issue. And if we look first at labral tears, what he found was that, um, I suppose the first thing to say is that in all of these studies, the quality of the evidence and the risk of bias is quite variable, so we have to take all of that into consideration. But in, in people with hip-related pain, there is limited evidence um, of a labral tear in about 60% of people using um, MRI with contrast. And that's very similar to the prevalence of labral tears that we would see in people with um, hip-related pain. And that's done in MRI without um, contrast. And I think the important thing is that we probably didn't expect this going in. We sort of thought that there would be more labral tears in people with hip pain. We know that the labrum is important to the structure of the hip, and we also know that it has potential to be a nociceptor driver. So it, when we went into this study, we actually thought that people with hip-related pain might have had more labral tears. But the evidence available at the moment, and realise that it is limited and moderate, tells us that's not the case. Um, as I said, these are still cross-sectional studies and more work needs to be done in the longitudinal studies, but that's the um, data at the moment. And the other thing we wanted to look at is, well, what's the burden of having a labral tear? As I said, it may be that they're not more prevalent, but they, they certainly affect a person's ability to, to do things. And there are now three studies that have shown no relationship between labral tears and pain um, on the WOMAC. Um, and, and the HOOS, which is another um, measure, a patient report outcome for um, hip-related pain, and also um, physical function. So right now there's no evidence to say that having a labral tear actually is related to the severity of your symptoms. Um, and what about chondropathy? So this is defined as usually cartilage defects in, in imaging-related studies. And what we found there is in asymptomatic athletes, Sorry, in symptomatic athletes, there was a prevalence of 64%, which was much higher than the prevalence of people without symptoms. So in, in, the, in the systematic review to date of all of the studies looking at, looking at chondral tears, chondral defects, in, um, in people we see that people with symptoms are much more likely to have a chondral defect. And again, this is something that was a little bit surprising because we know that um, cartilage is aneural and can't necessarily be a nociceptive driver, but we certainly see there are many more chondral defects in people with pain than in people without pain. So if we summarise all of that together, we see that hip-related pain is associated with having a, a cartilage defect or chondropathy. 
but labelled pathology seems to be similar in people with and without pain. Now, there's a couple of things we need to remember. We know that imaging is not uh, flawless in itself, and MRI is not necessarily the best uh, technique to pick up uh, labral tears. Um, we saw little to no correlation between labral tears and um, the severity of labral tears and pain and symptoms in patients. There are a couple of, there's very few studies have looked at the long term effects of having a labral tear, but certainly there doesn't appear to be a relationship between having a labral tear and the development of symptoms over time. But there are no prospective studies at the moment looking at um, the symptomatic looking at symptomatic populations and then following these over time. So this is something that we're going to try and address in our study and I'm sure there's plenty of other people looking at that at the moment. But my question was to try and look at athletes with hip OA and um, the systematic review we did in the first place, we did in all people. And when you think about um, athletes, as we heard this morning, I mean, they do go into positions that may be more likely to aggravate their hips. So they have more repeated contacts, they have higher impacts, they're doing a lot more rotation, they're getting more into these positions of impingement. So perhaps having a CAM morphology might be more important in athletes than in the general population. So Josh, for his second study, did a... Um, a systematic review just in athletes, and that was presented yesterday in the poster session. And I'm going to summarise the results with um, everything here today. So if we just look at CAM morphology, um, we don't actually have any studies, that, we don't actually have a systematic review that has looked at just athletes, but if we look at hip pain in athletes and non-athletes combined, we see that the prevalence of CAM morphology is about the same as in asymptomatic athletes. When we're looking at labral pathology, we see that um, there is similar um, prevalence of, of labral pathology in people with hip pain and also in our no pain populations. Um, and you've got to realise there are fewer studies looking at um, athletes and there are general populations as well. In chondropathy, it appears that people with pain are more likely to have chondral lesions than people without pain. So there's still a lot of work to be done in this space. We certainly don't have all of the answers, but we have some indication that some of these structural pathologies may not necessarily be associated with some of the symptoms that we're seeing in people with hip pain. So what about this relationship between CAM morphology and OA? And we heard about this a little bit this morning. So these are the three largest studies that have looked at the association between having a CAM morphology and developing end-stage osteoarthritis down the track. And as we heard this morning, they're mostly, the CAM morphology is mostly reported from AP radiographs, but they are large studies looking at 1,000 hips, 1,000 hips and 4,500 hips. In the Chingford study, which is done in the UK, they only looked at women and they're in the age of 44 to 67. And what we see in that study is that having a CAM morphology related to an increased odds of having a total hip replacement over a 19 year follow up. And that was done in both a, a case control study and also in a prospective cohort. The Czech study, which is the paper that um, Rinche Agricola worked on, we see that CAM morphology was also associated with an increased odds of end stage hip OA. And the Rotterdam study, which is looking at people aged 55, women aged, men and women aged over 55, there was an increased odds of incidence, so new osteoarthritis, uh, which is uh, KNL grade greater than two, um, and also total hip replacement. So we see there definitely is an increased odds of having osteoarthritis in people with a CAM morphology. But these are all done in population studies. They're not done in athletes. And in most cases, they're in middle-aged people, so in their 40s and 50s. But the other thing we have to look at is the absolute risk. So when we look at an odds ratio, we're comparing the risk of one group compared to the risk of another group. And I know that Paul's going to talk about that later today. But in the, uh, in the Czech study, of all of the hips, um, with an alpha angle greater than 60, which is a definition for having a CAM morphology, only 11% of those people actually went on to get end-stage hip osteoarthritis. And if you look at a more severe CAM morphology of 83 degrees, we see that goes up, but it's still only to 25%. 
So what we're looking at, and we acknowledge that they are APs, and so they may be missing some part of the story here, but the absolute risk of having end-stage osteoarthritis is much lower than when we think about it as an odds ratio. If we look at it the other way around, in, of those 1,411 hips, only 39 had end-stage osteoarthritis, and about 44% of those had an alpha angle of greater than 60. So there is a relationship there, but it's not a one-way street. We're not seeing that everybody that has a CAM morphology is going to go on to have end-stage osteoarthritis. And this is similar in the Rotterdam study, where the, um, of the people with incident hip OA, CAM morphology was present in about 12 to 18%. And I think the other interesting thing is that regardless of the cohort, there are more, the prevalence of CAM morphology is higher in men than in women, um, but the risk of CAM morphology development was actually the same. So even though fewer women than men have a CAM morphology, if you have it, the risk of developing osteoarthritis is the same in both groups. So we have, I think we're fortunate to have these large cohort studies to give us a lot of really good information in this space, but it also opens up a lot of questions for us as well. So, you know, what happens to the people with a CAM morphology that don't go on to get osteoarthritis? Why are they protected? And then what about the people that develop osteoarthritis without a CAM morphology? And obviously in this space we don't have a lot of information on athletes and they may be putting themselves at different risks because of the loads that they're putting on their hips as well. What about clinical osteoarthritis? Um, in a subset of those people in the Czech cohort who had no radiographic OA at baseline, um, the presence of a CAM didn't predict new clinical hip OA, and that was defined uh, using the American College of Rheumatology criteria of hip pain with loss of hip internal rotation. Um, but it did predict having a total hip replacement. So, the predictive value of CAM morphology for clinical hip OA is still unclear at this point in time. So if we try and sort of put all that together, we see that CAM morphology can increase the risk of hip OA, particularly end-stage hip OA, but not in all people. So there's a lot of people out there running around with a symptomatic or an asymptomatic uh, CAM morphology that are not going to get um, severe osteoarthritis in their hip. We don't know why some of them will develop um, OA and some don't, and that's obviously something we need to be looking at as researchers. We need to identify the factors that are associated with the progression of the progression from CAM morphology to hip osteoarthritis, and much more work is needed in younger populations and those who are, um, who are athletes and involved in, in physical pursuits. So when I think about hip OA in the athlete, we can say, well, okay, we've got these patients, they've got their pain, might have some clicking or grinding, but we know that only a percentage of them are going to have these structural findings. So we don't even know the importance of these findings. So should we be actually doing something about them or not? I don't think we really have the answers to that right now. We don't know whether surgery can change the natural history of some of these conditions. So we heard yesterday about the study um, from Damien Griffin that showed that the people who have arthroscopic surgery and the, and the patients that had physio improved. But the difference between the two groups at the end of a year was only seven points out of 100. So is that really a good enough justification for having hip arthroscopy compared to having physiotherapy? And the other argument we know is that having surgery will slow down um, the progression of osteoarthritis in the hip, and we just don't have enough evidence for that at the moment. Uh, there's conflicting evidence from the two studies I could find, one using degemeric and one using T1 row, which are imaging methods that allow us to look at sort of cartilage change over time. So there's certainly not clear and compelling evidence that we can actually change the natural history of osteoarthritis with surgery. So as a physio and put my physio hat on, I say, well, you know, rather than focus on these structural abnormalities, maybe we should be thinking about what matters to the patient. We've heard that a bit over the last couple of days. What are some of the features? What are some of the impairments they have? What are some of the, um, the impact of pain is having on them? And can we address some of those things? So that's what I want to chat about now. So what is the burden of having hip OA or hip related pain for the athlete? So I'm going to say Signia, because I'm pretty sure I can't pronounce her last name in any way correctly, uh, did a systematic review looking at um, 
looking at patient-reported outcomes of people doing hip arthroscopy. Because there are many more studies of patients having hip arthroscopy than patients who aren't having hip arthroscopy, most of the, the data that we have available to us is for those patients. And she looked at people who were, sorry, this is my review, looked at people who were pre-op through to up to five years post-surgery on a variety of patient-reported outcomes. And I'm just going to summarise those. So there were significant improvements in the activities of daily living, sport function and pain, uh, VAS, so pain on a visual analog scale, um, over the timeline right out to four or five years. But there were only a couple of studies that looked at pain and quality of life changes that she was able to put into this. And the patient reported outcomes um, at uh, three to six months was still not fantastic, so I put a line at sort of 60, which is 60 out of 100 in terms of how a patient's rating themselves. And we can see that quality of life remains low and pain has only improved um, by a small amount. So we need to know a little bit more about what happens to these patients over time. So I'm going to highlight some work that Jo did in her PhD. And uh, these are cross-sectional studies, so they're not longitudinal studies. So first off, Joe has a group of people who don't have any pain, and we're able to see on the IHOT33, which is uh, an outcome measure commonly used for people having hip arthroscopy, um, and then subscales of the HOOS, which are the symptoms, the sport, and the quality of life. We can see that people um, without any pain are up around 100. These are Signia's data looking at um, sport and rec and who's qual. And uh, these were the pre-op data that she had in a systematic review. So Joe's population were people who were um, 18 months post hip arthroscopy. And if you're looking at that, you can see, well, OK, they're certainly better than the people who um, were pre-op in Signia's uh, systematic review. But um, well, certainly if we look at quality of life, they're still down around the 60%. And she also divided her group into those with and without chondropathy. So if we're thinking about, well, how does hip OA affect um, our symptoms, we can see that the people with chondropathy uh, certainly have lower um, patient report outcomes uh, with respect to the IHOT 33 and also the sport and rec. But certainly both groups have what we would still consider suboptimal outcomes in terms of quality of life measured with either the IHOT or the HOOS. And that's something that um, Michael was talking about this morning. So they might be getting better, but are they getting good? And I know that's a phrase that, that Eva has used. So they're better than pre-op, but there's certainly a long way to go in terms of, of them being um, happy with their, with their hip. Stephanie Philbay is a PhD who did some work with me a number of years ago. She's now working at Oxford. And she looked um, in these same patients that Joe recruited for her PhD, looked at all the different individual items of the IHOT 33. So in this graph, the red are the people with the severe chondropathy and the blue are the mild chondropathy. And we can see that severe chondropathy are significant, significantly worse on elements of quality of life. And the three specific things we looked at were being concerned about their fitness, being concerned with pain after they've been involved in physical activity, and their quality of life deterioration because of their physical activity and sport participation. So if we're thinking about does OA affect their quality of life, the answer is based on one very small study, it's likely to be important. So chondropathy, um, this wasn't necessarily in athletes, but chondropathy in people does seem to affect their quality of life. What about other things that might be burdensome to the patient? So return to sport, we heard about this a couple of times yesterday, um, so I'm not going to go into this in too much de detail, but only about a only 74% of, of people after hip arthroscopy are going to return to sport. And we heard about the risk of bias in those studies and some of the difficulty with reporting. But we also heard about how important it is for people if they think they're going to be able to return to sport and they don't res return to sport in terms of um, how that affects their, their satisfaction. And we also heard about this study yesterday, so I'm not going to go into this in too much. I've just highlighted that um, in a single study that was that was uh, published this year, that only 57% of people actually return to sport at their pre-injury level, and only 17% of those, 17% uh, of people return to their pre-injury performance. So this is a burden for people who have hip-related pain. These are again post-hip arthroscopy because we don't have the data in non-arthroscopy patients. But if we're thinking about the burden of hip pain plus or minus some of the structural changes that might occur alongside um, 
the, the progression of hip, of hip arthritis, we see that the condition is very burdensome. And so these might be some of the things that we want to be trying to address as physiotherapists as well. Uh, on the same theme of getting better isn't the same as being good, or in this case, being normal. This is one of Christian Thorborg's papers that's recent in about 100 participants um, having surgery. So the bottom line on that graph is all of the, the pre-op scores. And you can see that people do get better. Um, and um, one of the conclusions was that only between 45% and 70% of people actually achieved the improvement that's considered to be minimally, that's considered to be clinically important after surgery. So even though people are improving, they're actually not improving beyond what is considered to be clinically important in many of the cases. And then if you compare those data to what's considered to be the healthy reference point, we can see that somewhere between 20 and 38% of participants um, are actually achieving the healthy control reference value. And I've highlighted again the two that are particularly low, and that is quality of life and physical activity. So these are the recurring themes that in quality of life and return to physical activity, we are seeing a large burden of hip-related pain, albeit mostly from studies that have looked at hip arthroscopy at the moment. So our study is one of the few that hasn't, so I've just um, highlighted the black line here. So these are the baseline data from our 190 uh, football players that we're collecting data on in Australia. So these are people who are not about to have surgery. These are people who are coming in to be part of a research project looking at hip-related pain. And you can clearly see that that black line sits uh, certainly better than people who are pre-op for surgery, but not better than people who are post-op from surgery as well. And those same sort of um, areas that we think might be important around quality of life. So people who aren't presenting to surgery, and in our case they're just coming into a research project, are quite impaired with respect to quality of life. So these are things I think we can address or we can try and address in our physiotherapy, surgery, medical practices. But I want to just have the one last slide about the psychosocial. And this is a study that Mark Ryman spoke about yesterday. Um, and I think for those of us who read it, I think it was quite impactful. And I think for those of us who also research and work clinically in areas other than hip pain, made us also think about perhaps we should be looking at this in other conditions as well. So as we heard yesterday, um, this is a paper that was published this year in, in an observational cohort in the military. Um, they had uh, nearly 2,000 people who had hip arthroscopy in a two-year follow-up. This is their graph on the left-hand side. So the blue is the prevalence of these comorbidities before they had surgery. And then the grey bars are the prevalence of these comorbidities after surgery. On the far right is all of the comorbidities joined together, but then we have mental health, post-traumatic stress disorder, chronic pain, and what we can see is in all of the conditions, the prevalence goes up two years after surgery. The bottom bar, which is the, like the hash bar, is the cases that persisted, so they were there pre-op and they were still there post-op, and the solid grey bars are those that were new cases. So we can see that there are Certainly in this patient population, which was a, um, a cohort study, so it's not an RCT, uh, we can definitely see that um, these uh, comorbidities become more prevalent after surgery. And they proposed a number of reasons why this might be the case, and we sort of heard that a bit this morning. So the stress of surgery on their mental health, um, their reduced physical activity after surgery, and again, as I said before, this is a military cohort, so being physically active might have been really important to them. But we're also talking about the athlete, and being physically active is really important to athletes, obviously, as well. Changing their sleep behaviours, because part of the comorbidity is around sleep. And also we heard this morning about patient expectations. And so just brings us to think that when we're looking at the burden of some of this hip-related pain, we do need to consider, obviously, the patient as a whole, and we've always known that, but there are some really specific things here that makes me think as a researcher and also as a clinician, I think we need to do better in this space and not just related to hip pain. So I think it's important to realise these results do not indicate causation, but they are there. There is an increase in these comorbidities. 
these data do need to be replicated in longitudinal cohort studies and in other populations, so in perhaps um, in some non-military and in some non-surgery cohorts as well. But it does make us think as clinicians that perhaps there are things we can look at, some things we could be doing better, and obviously it highlights the need for comprehensive care for our patients. So again, when we're thinking about trying to reduce the burden of, of hip OA within and hip pain for our athletes, I think it just comes back to the point that we need to be asking the patient, what matters to them? What matters to me? So what are my treatment options? What is the likelihood of success? What are the positive and negative um, benefits that I'm going, or what are the positive benefits, but what might be some of the negative um, outcomes that might come my way when I Involve, when I get involved in either surgery or non-surgery or different surgery or different non-surgery, how much improvement am I likely to get? We've got good data now from Signia's um, systematic review and other studies that we can say to patients, this is how much improvement you should expect to get on average. What outcomes do I want? Do I want to be able to run again? We might say, well, we shouldn't be telling them to run again or play sport again, but if they want to, we need to know what do they want to get out of it? And we need to think about what's the likelihood that they're going to get that outcome. How much rehab will I do? We heard Jo's talk yesterday that people in her study need to do six hours. If they're not going to do six hours, we need to have different options for them. Because if we, if we put them in a program that they need to do six hours and they're not going to do it, we're setting themselves and ourselves up to fail. How much will it cost? Um, that's an important factor for pretty much every patient, I think. So, Joe talked about this yesterday, but we really need to involve our patients in the decision making. We need to give them all of the information we have. And when we think about surgery and hip arthroscopy, there is a lot of information out there. So, it's our role as physios, doctors, surgeons, to be sharing that information with the patients so that they can make their decisions in an informed manner. We need to think about the types of treatment and co-creation. I thought I was going to be really quick. I'm sorry. The last bit's very, very quick. Um, the other thing is physios, that we think about the physical impairments and the things that we think that might be related to the development of OA or the persistence of pain, that we can do something about a muscle strength and the way that people move. I just want to highlight this. this is a paper that Eva wrote a few years ago about knee pain, but I think it can apply to the hip equally well, that we know that muscle weakness may compromise joint stability and helps us and therefore decrease joint load attenuation, that movement patterns and joint ranges may place the joint in high load situations, and that joint injury can compromise muscle function, and that we might think about FAI being on this OA continuum here um, and gives us an opportunity to perhaps um, intervene early on in the piece and actually stop people from developing osteoarthritis. This is a paper done by Matt Freak, who's here today as well, and he showed in a systematic review, he reviewed all of the studies, that hip range of motion was not different in people with FAI compared to controls. However, strength impairments were seen. So people have impaired strength in all directions. They have loss of trunk endurance and loss of dynamic balance compared to healthy age match controls. Matt King's another PhD student who's not here today because he's getting married very soon. He did a systematic review of biomechanics. And just briefly, um, there aren't enough studies in this area, but Cara's going to give us a fantastic talk if I ever get off the stage. But what we found was that when we look at hip flexion, that patients with FAI have less excursion of hip um, in the sagittal plane, less peak hip extension, and less hip internal rotation and ER talk, external rotation talk. So some indication that some biomechanics are impaired in people with FAI, and I'll let Cara talk about that next. These are just a couple of slides that Matt's working on at the moment, just showing that men and women have different um, biomechanics. And the people with hip-related pain have differences in biomechanics that we would expect from a non-pain population. But I just want to highlight that in our single-leg drop dump task that we looked at, that not only did they have differences in um, AP tilt and therefore um, sagittal plane hip, but they also had lower knee flexion moments and no, lower knee ankle moments as well. So perhaps there's some compensatory uh, mechanism that women uh, don't have that men do have. So just to highlight here that hip muscle, hip muscle weakness was a feature of hip OA, 
Um, and for those with hip pain, movement patterns may be associated with um, movement patterns associated with lower loads may be a factor in people with um, FA, with hip pain. So this is, I think, my last slide or second last slide. So again, going back to reducing the burden of hip pain, we need to think about it from a patient perspective. What is the right thing for them? The structure may or may not be related to their symptoms, and we need to think about their psychosocial impairments as well as their physical impairments to try and come up with a comprehensive uh, treatment pack package for them. And we clearly need to do a lot more work looking at prognostic factors, clinical predictors and mediating factors in the long-term relationship between having hip-related pain and developing hip OA. Thank you, and I'm so sorry. <laughs>